most people are running from, not running to. If they want to be able, so often my ads will start with, you know, when I'm inboxing people in recruiting versus having people apply to an ad, my subject line says, are you happy and being treated well? And when people, re yeah, <laughs> when people reply to that, I love it when people say to me, I love where I work. Thank you for offering this opportunity to me, but I'm not, they're not even interested in speaking to us. That's when I want to go hunt down that law firm and say, I don't know what you're doing, but up level it and keep doing what you're doing because your people won't even talk to a recruiter because you've obviously created a very amazing culture. Do you want to know how to make your job postings pop? How do you weed through a sea of applicants and land that dream employee? How do we make the hiring process better and easier for firms? This week, we're joined by Molly McGrath of Hiring and Empowering Solutions. For nearly 25 years, she's coached and consulted law firms to help them get the best results from their hiring efforts. Now, we just finished this episode, and Molly gives us a ridiculous number of tips and tricks that are going to help you level up your hiring and interviewing game. Seriously, there's probably a new record for the amount of actionable items you'll get out of a five-star council episode. We're going to cover how to approach the job posting itself, what information to put out there, and how to set expectations for your interview process. Ultimately, we want to attract the ideal new employee for your firm. This is a can't-miss discussion, so let's get to it. I'm John Strohmeyer, and this is the Five Star Council Podcast. The market for legal services is shifting, and lawyers who don't adapt will be left behind. This podcast gives you a competitive edge in today's market by sharing the client service lessons you probably didn't learn in law school or in law practice. Let's start the show. This episode of Five Star Council is sponsored by Text Expander. Supercharge your team with the power of Text Expander. Now, I've been using Text Expander for years, and it's a huge help. I save hours every week by using the snippets to consistently generate pre written text for communications. This saves me from being lashed to the keyboard, coming up with the right words, and then typing them correctly. I've typed it correctly once, so it's ready whenever I type the short abbreviation I chose. Text Expander does the rest of the typing for me. Now, I started using text replacement years ago to streamline and speed up my time entry. I had a few snippets that included most of the words that I needed for any entry. I'd enter that snippet and then delete the words I didn't need. The best part was not having to type the same phrases over and over again. Telephone conference with, office conference with, preparation for same, and on and on and on. I'm sure you've got the same stock phrases that you can type blindfolded and don't care to ever think about again. Ultimately, it means you can do more with the same resources. Less repetition, fewer errors, and greater consistency. Text Expander is available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad, so you can use your snippets across your programs and platforms. For example, I can respond to a LinkedIn message on my phone, iPad, or desktop with one Calendly link, and all I have to remember is my custom abbreviation. Five-star counselors can get 20% off their first year by following the link in the show notes or heading to fivestarcouncil.com slash text expander. Molly, it is great to have you here with us today. Oh, I'm so excited and honored to be your guest today. Thank you, John. Of course. Molly, so I invited you on because hiring and interviewing is just, I mean, it's one of those skills that people overlook. I remember being at one firm before I started my own where one of the partners said, well, of course I know what I'm doing. I've interviewed thousands of people. And it comes across to me, having sat in interviews with some of these people, having been interviewed by lawyers like this, that it's a lot like practicing your golf swing where you don't know what you're doing. You're just kind of aping what you've seen other people do. And because they did it and you got hired, clearly that's the right answer. And so whatever they were doing was right because it generated the correct response of hiring you for that firm. The reality is that's probably not the best way. And so today I really want to kind of dig into how can we make the process better and easier for law firms? And thankfully, you've got a lot of you've got a lot of thoughts on this, and my job is to extract some of those thoughts from you. 
Oh, yes. And I know attorneys, they'd love to take notes feverishly and they really love a step-by-step process. So I'm more than happy for anyone that wants to reach out to me after today's podcast that they can certainly reach out and I'd be happy to share my process. But attorneys are very busy, right? And they're not very good at the interviewing process or skilled in it or classically trained in it. And it is forever ebbing and flowing and moving, especially since the pandemic. Legal space is the tightest it has ever been in the history of time because of Zoom, because of the virtual world, because of the tight space. Your interviewing process really has to be very clear, concise, well-communicated, and efficient. There is no longer the times of having these long interview process that are drawn out weeks and months and what have you, because people are getting made offers on the spot now because law firms that do hire recruiters and or have in-house talent are learning how to streamline the process. So for me, what I would say is the best way to be able to really streamline this process is number one recruit an admin person in your office. Maybe it's somebody who you're replacing within the firm because they're up-leveling or somebody who has sat in that position before. And the goal is that you post an ad, you do not make it like a job description. There is a very big difference between an ad and a job description. The number one mistake I see that attorneys make and law firms make is they have this dissertation, which is so long for the ad and people don't even read it. They're already tuning out and they won't respond because they'll say that if this is the barrier of entry, is this like this long and cumbersome within even the ad, it's very telling of the firm. So often I will see attorneys put in job descriptions. Number one, never put the salary because a lot of times when attorneys will call me, they're like, well, you know, so-and-so down the street's only paying them, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll post that for the ad and you'll miss out on candidates. I never put the salary for a very good reason. I want to talk to everyone and anyone. I don't want to miss out on a rock star or superstar because of $2 an hour or $2,000 a year. And then make sure that your ad is written like you're writing it for match.com to try to land a date. Like you, this is a sales process. You don't want to put, if you don't have a cover letter, if you don't have writing samples, if you don't, that is not the place for this in the ad. You want to make it fun, exciting. You want it to communicate your culture and you have to speak into the other person's listening. The legal space is so incredibly tight. So I will always start with like a sales pitch for the first paragraph of the ad having nothing to do with the job. So if I'm looking for an associate attorney, I'm really training to paint the picture of the culture because the reason that people will take your job or your interview is because your culture. Most people are running from not running to. If they want to be able, so often my ads will start with, you know, when I'm inboxing people and recruiting versus having people apply to an ad, my subject line says, are you happy and being treated well? Ooh, and when oh, people that's so good. Re- Yeah. When people reply to that, I love it when people say to me, I love where I work. Thank you for offering this opportunity to me, but I'm not, they're not even interested in speaking to us. That's when I want to go hunt down that law firm and say, I don't know what you're doing, but up level it and keep doing what you're doing because your people won't even talk to a recruiter because you've obviously created a very amazing culture. Oh, uh, Molly, I'm just uh, writing down a bunch of notes. There are several things I want to talk to you about. I want to start first with that ad idea and the fact that you're selling your firm to other people. It's, you know, people, our employees ultimately are volunteers. Sure, we're paying them, but they have a choice. They're not shackled to us at all. I look back on my history. I've been at, I was at three different firms before I started my own. People are moving. They're going to move. And anticipating that you've got to make a pitch of why it's going to be different and what's marginally going to be different. If the only difference really is salary or possibly the technical work, it's real easy to get lost in why anybody would really want to come work for you. And so I, while you were mentioning this, I pulled up what we have as our job post and what we put out. And I'm just looking through things. 
there are tweaks that I want to make. But one of the things that we do is we're trying to give folks an idea of what it's like in it, to work here. And we do want people to see this is not the standard law firm. I mean, literally, one of the bullet points is you're either a ninja class Microsoft Word user or you're willing to achieve that status. Uh. And the point is, look, we are going to use Word if you, this is going to be a problem. We're giving people a glimpse into us early on of how we operate. If you're going to have a problem with Word, that's fine. Opt out now. But I'm also saying ninja class, which like I, I'm going to just go ahead and say there are probably not a lot of other law firms that would even put that out there as a way of just saying, look, yes, we are going to be serious about this. I need you to be good at it, but I'm also going to have some fun with it. And, you know, the the thought that this is who we are, we're selling people on who's going to apply. It's give, It's a lot better than just somebody cold emailing me. Here's my resume. Here's my writing sample. Can I get an interview? It also makes it really easy. Go look at the job post. If this fits for you, then do the things that I'm asking you to do. Yeah, that's like step two. I mean, you really, truly have to think this. You want people to at least speak to candidates. That's what I'm hearing so often. People say, I've had my ad out there for six months. I'm not finding anyone who's either good or I have low response to it, what have you. And when I look at the ad, I'm like, you're not you're not standing out amongst the crowd at all. You're not painting the picture of why someone would want to even consider interviewing you with you. So step one is getting them to actually to talk to as many people as you can. And so you're, now I can hear the attorney's eyes rolling saying, I don't have time to do all these one hour interviews. I think that's the biggest mistake that people make too, is especially, I mean, the pandemic gave us the most amazing gift called Zoom Rooms. And if I do a five minute phone interview, so I can get through about 40 interviews in an hour where I'm just calling people and I'm hitting right in the jugular. I'm asking them, you know, great. I'm, and I, I, I will tell people, I want to protect your time, my time. I'm just a sourcer. I pretend like I'm just an admin. I'm like, you know, I don't want to waste your time. Can you tell me what you're looking for in regards to salary? That's the number one question. That's usually the last question that people ask in the interview process. They'll get writing samples. They'll go through the resume. They'll do a one hour interview. Then they'll do a team interview. They go through all this and then they'll find out that they're way off on salary. So that's the first question I ask about salary, about commute. You're, you understand this is an in-office position, or especially now, or remote, and things of that nature, and make certain. And then I find out, why are you looking for a new opportunity? Those are the only questions. I don't go into knowledge. I don't go into skill set. I don't go into any of that, because if we can't get the logisticals right, the rest of it really doesn't matter. Molly, I like that what you're doing is starting out by getting the big pieces out of the way. If if you're not going to have a meeting of the minds on those, or if it's going to be a sticking point, you're best to just go ahead and say, this doesn't work before you invest three, four, seven hours of interview time and admin time and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. That's the main thing. And, and so often I'm just amazed at how many people wait for that to be the last. And if I find out they're a great candidate and I find out that we're in alignment with money, knowing there's negotiation, a couple thousand dollars here or there. They're very clear that it's in office now and they're willing to do it. Then from there, what I'll do is spend maybe five more minutes going into high level. You understand what this position is. You understand. You read the job description, things of that nature. Then I'll go on a Zoom interview with them. The other thing I want to mention is I never, ever put the law firm name in the ads. I see so many law firms that'll put the law firm name in their ads. And I think that, again, is a barrier of entry because people have in their mind small firm, big firm, a lot of firms or websites, they haven't updated it in a <laughs> long time. Sometimes they don't have all their employees on there. So they think it's just, you know, two people, or they have all their virtual employees on there. And it looks like a big firm when they're looking for a medium sized firm. So you really don't want to put your law firm, I you want to sell your law firm if it's the right candidate. So, so often when I can sell culture, I can share that, you know, maybe the billable 
billable hour requirements are lower. There are no billable hour requirements or we don't work Fridays or what have you. And I can help paint the picture of the uh, future for this employee that uses this esoteric term called opportunity. And so often when I ask people, tell me why you're even considering talking to a recruiter, even considering a new opportunity, uh, new position, they'll say, well, I'm looking for more opportunity. And when I really, 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 truly break down their opportunity, you know, everybody has their own definition of that. It doesn't mean a bigger title. It doesn't mean more money for some people. Sometimes just me being able to sell that this firm only works four days a week or they kick off at noon on Fridays or they have happy hour. Guess what? Some of my best ads that get the response to is says, we bring our dogs to work and we go to happy hour on Thursdays. Those are the people that are like, uh, I'll take a $20,000 pay cut. If you're telling me that I could bring my dog to work and you're telling me that you guys like, like each other and you go and have wine on Thursdays and we get bug off work at one o'clock on Fridays because we're not clock watchers and we do everything we can to get our work done, get time entered into Clio or whatever it is. So I think you really truly... A lot of times law firms, are, the reason they're not getting good candidates is because they're presenting themselves as heavy and hard and stuffy in an old traditional law firm. And people don't want that anymore. It's surprising. People, you know, as a generation above the millennials, people seem to think this was new for millennials to want some sort of, you know, work-life balance, whatever you want to call it. It turns out most of us want to do enough work and then spend time not working. And some of that time, you know, should be not sleeping as well. It really is surprising that people think this was some new thing. I really like the idea of selling culture because if you're not going to put the name of the law firm out there, you've got to have something that's more than the name that's engraved on the door. You've got to be able to tell them, well, how are you actually different? How can you put the culture of the firm, you know, if, if the firm hasn't defined their culture, how can you start to define that culture for them? Oh, I love that question. So this is the easiest, quickest way to do it. I have, I will have the attorneys and whoever else they want in the video or employees uh, to record a five, 10 minute video talking about why they're the best law firm to work for and talking about their culture and what makes them unique above any other law firm in the marketplace. And I actually send that out in the ads. So that is a video ad that we use. Again, keeping the ad very simple, written like a match.com profile, written from a sales perspective and communicating, you know, for somebody to at least respond. It's just like a Facebook ad. If you're trying to get a lead for your business, you just want a response. Then you can send them out a video ad and that works beautifully. Super simple. Some attorneys will go and sit out on their patio. It's, you know, they really want to have have the culture. They're sitting in the conference room and it's then the client service coordinator or paralegal and they're having a coffee chat and they're really talking about it. And those are some of the best response that I will get when people will apply to the ad or they'll respond. I'll shoot them a video and say, you know, I really want to communicate what our culture is here. And that's the easiest, quickest, most efficient way to do that. That is so interesting because if I understand the process right, you're writing the match.com profile first. That has mm -hmm. no or probably no identifying information about the law firm. Correct. But once you've got the hook set of somebody says, oh, that looks interesting, that's when you're willing to it, you know, share the video of one of the partners or whoever it is, at which point somebody could backtrack probably say, oh, you know, David Johnson, attorney. Well, he's an attorney. No, at this he's... time you're revealing the firm's name. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's not secret all the way through. No. But they can at least, you know, they've shown some interest and that's when you can say, all right, we're rewarding your basic interest by letting you know, okay, well, this is the two-person shop or this is the 500-person mega firm. Whatever it is, they can figure it out, but you're not just advertising for all to see Firm X is looking for somebody. Yeah, because attorneys listen in, or hiring managers, whoever's listening to this, the days of you should be lucky to work here are over. The days of you should be lucky to have a job are over. I can't tell you how many attorneys will say to me, 
Well, I didn't, you know, when I became an associate in a firm or when I was an associate before I had my own own firm, I had to do this, this, this. I worked 80 hours a week. You know, I had to go through 17 interviews. And, you know, it's the old school story of walking to school uphill both ways in a raging snowstorm that your grandfather told. No one cares. (laughs) It's not inspiring. They don't feel bad for you. And they're like, well, that's even more reason I don't want to work for your firm because that's the mindset you have. That story, it doesn't matter anymore. It really, truly doesn't. And to your point, John, it's not a millennial thing of this whole, you know, work-life balance. I can't tell you how many people will email me and say, I don't want any millennials. And like, that. it, there's such this misconception around that the millennials started this or the pandemic started it or whatever it is. Here's the deal. People, in my opinion, have never been more invested in where they work ever. I have firms now that have unlimited PTO because of all the studies out there for people that have unlimited PTO work way harder and longer. They might be on vacation and still working. They'll work on the weekends, they'll work on the nights, what have you. I'm not lobbying for that, but it's a mindset. It's a mindset. The mindset that people and human beings have invested in and that listening to podcasts, uh, personal and professional development and growth. There's so much at our fingertips on social media and coming in your inbox, always speaking about mindset. So it's not necessarily just this chalk up of work-life balance. It's about I'm spending, where am I spending my time? I'm spending most of my time with my colleagues at work. And I want it to be valuable. I want it to be impact driven. I want to be a difference maker. And I no longer want to do something anymore that is not aligned with purpose and passion. Oh, Molly, there's just, I'm looking down, I'm seeing we have gone through so much already that I feel like we could keep talking. We're, I mean, we're going to keep talking for a little bit longer, <laughs> but there's also just so much. And I'm going to start by saying, you know, the, the you should be lucky, that resonates so much. I, again, looking back at my own job history, I've switched firms a few times before starting my own. I know that my employees, there's a much greater chance that they're going to leave my employment long before they pass on. Like nobody's dying at their desk. The reality is they're all going to, at some point, find something better. My job as the employer is to make sure when they go, they think nice things about me. Why? You know, selfishly, hopefully they're going to go somewhere else where it's non-competitive work and they still have reason to send things back to me. And even if they do go work for a competitor, at least remember that, you know, hey, hopefully I treated you well. Um, and you're not, you know, you're, you don't harbor those thoughts of, well, when I was there, you know, I couldn't wait to get out of that, uh, pit of psychotic vipers. <laughs> yeah. You said something really, I want to just touch on really quick. So often when people are interviewing, they're like, this needs to be a forever person. I'm afraid this person's going to leave in two years or three years or what have you. Well, I have a different spin on that where I tell the, um, the law firm, just assume this person's going to be out of here in 24 to 36 months, because then that puts the accountability on you to get the most out of them. So often the attorneys say, well, it takes six months or a year to on-ramp, regardless of the position. I'm like, this causes you to streamline your onboarding process. And when you bring this person on, what you can do to get them to make your systems and your process so efficient that when they do leave, that it's easier to replace them and for them to to onboard someone. So if you shift your mindset from this is going to be a forever thing to maybe I'm lucky if I get a shelf life of two or three years out of this employee and you interact with it that way and your mindset's like that, then it causes you to be fully present and showing up 100% during their training and onboarding. Oh, yeah. Uh, Molly, I get that. I mean, having just brought on a new first-year associate, who's worked for me for the last year and a half as a law student, her on-ramping time is so much faster because she already knew roughly where things were. She knew how to find things. Things had changed even in the time since she left to start studying for finals in the bar. And when she came back four months later, things had changed, but they weren't totally different. 
And the fact that just this morning we had a new meeting with a client, she's now a month and a half in was just saying, oh, these things are getting so much easier. I know where to look for things. Uh, that as an employer, I'm like, yes, you know, great. She, I can hand more things to her and push more onto her. I'm not hoping that, oh golly, does she know how to do this? It's she's accepting and getting better at it, which is exactly what I want. And if she leaves in a few years, I will be sad. But the plan is get, you know, like, or to uh, backtrack, you know, the saying is, you know, what if we train them and they leave? It, the opposite is, well, what if we don't and they stay? Ah, yes. So one of the things I want to start closing with is you'd mentioned this early on of a more efficient process, you know, not streaming it out over weeks or months. I remember, you know, kind of the contrast of when I was hired by one of the law firms, I think I had six or seven interviews. It was always a one-off interview with one or two, sometimes three people, sometimes it was lunch, sometimes it was in the office, but it was stretched out over literally months. I'd have one or two meetings a week, then I wouldn't hear anything, then they'd say, oh, this partner wants to see you, or this partner wants to see you again by themselves. No indication of where I was in the process. Is there an end in sight? And eventually I got a job. The entire time it was just more stressful and real than it should have been because who knows what was going on. At the same time, you know, if I had had a better offer, if they're, you know, just at the market at the time, there wasn't a lot of spots for me. And I was hanging on to this process because I, I really was looking for something and they had what I was looking for. But if there had been a better offer, I would have abandoned ship much earlier. And I want to contrast that with when I got hired by the Four Seasons, I had exactly five interviews. They knew going in, it was going to be exactly five interviews. The first interview was with HR, and they were asking set behavioral-based interview questions. From there, I had a second HR interview just to confirm. Then I had an interview with uh, who was the person who was going to be one of my line managers. And then I interviewed with the head of the hotel. So that's four. There was the sneaky interview that they had with the, the executive office administrative assistant, where they would bring you through after you talk to HR, Hey, we want you to meet with one of the managers. And they brought me into the executive offices, sat me down next to the receptionist there. So this is not a standard hotel employee, but this is somebody working in the office. And they just, you know, oh, you'll be here, sit next to Leah for the next 20 minutes. Uh, or they didn't say next 20 minutes, but it really was, you know, here's Leah, she'll, you know, bring you back when it's time. With the thought, it's going to be a minute or two, but what that was in the, the sneaky interview of, did I treat Leah with respect? She's, you know, air quotes, just the receptionist. But I was still, you know, still being evaluated, her thoughts were important. And she was definitely being asked, how did I treat her? And everybody was going through this. It was, you know, I wasn't being interviewed for a high level management position. I was being interviewed to work at the front desk. They still put me through talking to my manager, the, the sneaky receptionist interview and talking with the hotel manager. It was all part of it. And at the end of it, you know, there was, look, we need to collect our notes. We'll be back with you in a week. But at no point did I think I was somewhere lost in the shuffle. And yeah. so, you know, it just, it, the, this is all kind of a long launching off point for having and knowing what that process should look like is something that firms need to do. It shouldn't be here. Let's, you know, we'll all kind of interview this person one at a time, and then we'll go into a conference room and argue about our feelings. So <laughs> what, you know, Bali, what should we be looking for in terms of the process once we actually start talking to candidates? I, I, first of all, if you have a candidate that you interviewed even is sitting around for even one week and they're still unemployed, there's something wrong with them. If you're looking in this market right now, it is not like it was even a year or two ago. So to your point, I always outline the process 
and um, and make the law firms be very, very, very strategic about staying on top of it. So number one, you do a five minute phone interview, hit those logisticals, the things that kill all the deal, because we all know time kills all deals. So that's number one. Number two, I would say is for you to um, then do a Zoom interview. I outline it with them. If they pass the Zoom interview with me or your receptionist or your hiring manager, whoever it is, then I tell them right off the bat, I'm running a background check, doing social media check. Is there anything that I'm going to find? So often people wait to run a background check till it's offer. Just this week, I had four attorneys in the greater Seattle area that were associate attorneys that failed the background check. Even though they told me they would pass it, I found stuff on it. And so it's amazing how people wait for these bombs that will kill all the deal till the end of the process. Then I typically bring them in with the main partners, whoever has to be there. Everybody has to be in the room at the same time. You can't labor this out. They get in a Zoom meeting with them. If they pass that, then they come in and they spend the day with everyone in the firm. And you might go to lunch with Susie, the receptionist. You might go to what have you. And then at that time, you will know. And that's when we do the hiring assessments and things of that nature right there when they're in the office. So I paint the picture for the candidate and then I make it, the law firm make a decision within 24 hours. Oh, you wow. have enough data and information. You know, you really truly do at this point. And so when you labor it, what happens is that you can't remember. You can't remember candidate one from candidate seven. And in this day and age, you're not going to have seven candidates for any position, even if it's a receptionist. If they're really, really good, the market is so incredibly tight. And so you really have to, to your point, do the beginning, the middle, the end. I've had law firms that have tried to have sneak attacks along the way and the candidates out. They're like, they weren't up front. They weren't. So it tells me that they either don't have a system or a process or they have no value for their system and process and just completely abandon it here. And then I'm going to be expected to jump through hoops and to overperform for a process for something that they don't even value or respect. Oh my gosh. Molly, that is a great summary of the process. I think we could keep on going on this forever, but I want to respect that all your time at the time of uh, our dear listener. Where can we find out more about you and your process? Yeah, absolutely. You go to hiringandempowering.com. Feel free to drop me a message in the um, contact page if you want me to share my hiring process with you. Um, and you can also subscribe. We drop a podcast every Tuesday with value bombs in regards to hiring, empowering leadership and communication. And we drop a blog every Thursday. Oh, Molly, so much information. There's so much more to know. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening. You can find more info on us and get your free white paper on client service at fivestarcouncil.com. You can get in touch with me at john at fivestarcouncil.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe wherever fine podcasts are found and leave us a review wherever you can.